Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of this word. Jim, thank you so much for reading this morning. Last week, our family went on vacation, and on one of the evenings, we met with friends. We met for trivia night. We thought it was going to be really, really fun because... We have no idea what this is all about, and the topic was the 2000s. We were all alive in that time, so I'm like, okay, recent history, no phones allowed. Each table is a team, so you first have to find your team name, and then you're given pieces of paper for each round, one piece of paper, and after each round, you have to give your papers, sorry, back to the MC who is then putting all these, who's having a big chart and putting all the teammates in order of who is going to win. Before I go any further, let me tell you, our team is probably not going to be on national TV. (laughs) We were not the last, no, we were about pretty good, and it was good to have people in their 20s with us uh, because they knew much more than the rest of us. There were about 14 categories. The first one was who dated whom in real life. No clue. We got pictures and had to figure out who goes with whom in real life, not in the movies. No clue. Did I tell you that spelling was also judged? I felt like being in school. So anyhow, Uh, those who were much younger and those who probably spent the last 24 years watching television, looking through the people's magazines and having a wonderful memory, they obviously got better scores than us. Sports, there was movie quotes, song lyrics, nothing, (laughs) absolutely nothing. Whereas our table was more thinking and pondering the sense and the meaning of each question and wondering the background of what happened in that time period. The other team just spit it out, just as multiplications tables in third grade. You got it. You got it. So, as I said, we had fun and it was a nice evening, and maybe I should study the 2000s for the next trivia night. Well, in the last four weeks, while our topic on the sermons was going back to school with Jesus. For four weeks, we studied four Gospels, starting Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Today, we are with John, so each week, one Gospel matches up perfectly. Today's gospel reading, which came wait for us, is in the third uh, chapter of John, so pretty in the beginning. What happened before? I always want to know, just like on the team when we did the trivia night. So what is the context here? Um, just before, Jesus was at a wedding, uh, and uh, the biggest and maybe the most popular or the first um, miracle he did, he 
changed water into wine, and you all have heard the story. So by now, in chapter 3, Jesus' fame is spreading all over as the miracle maker, as the teacher, as the preacher. And now, in chapter 3, we start that Nicodemus, somebody who should know it all, a religious leader, can't sleep. Anybody of you ever woken up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning with questions? I know I have. And then I get a drink of water. Maybe I write my questions down. Try a different sleeping position. Maybe watch some television. Go back to bed and then start all over again and just to see the clock changing to 2.15, 2.30, 2.45, you get it. I feel similar to Nicodemus because I have questions, deep questions. Nicodemus is a religious leader. He should know it all, just like these multiplication tables. You just know your rows of seven and of nine and of five. You can spit them out. He shouldn't have the questions. He should have all the answers. What do you do if you have deep questions and even writing them down in the middle of the night? It doesn't help. He goes to Jesus, sneaks out of the house, making sure that nobody is watching because after all, he is the religious leader. And how would that be if other people would see him? His reputation would shrink. Maybe people would laugh at him. Maybe he would feel ashamed and embarrassed. So he goes to Jesus in the middle of the night. I, first of all, I want to say thank you, Nicodemus, for daring to ask questions. It would have been so much easier if you can just stay in your lane, just spit out all the answers you know, and don't think about it. Keep on, keep on going, and if ever any doubts come in your mind, just try to push them away and continue just to spit out what you know. Nicodemus asked very interesting questions, and let me look back in my bulletin because I know that you have all read it after Kim read it to you. He first acknowledges who Jesus is, and then verse 4 he says, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Good question. I love people with questions. How? How? And then, can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? It's like another how question deepening up the first one. After Jesus answers him, his other question is, how can that be? How? I feel like reading a manual tells me exactly, like picking up IKEA furniture is a good example, telling one, two, however long it takes, now you do this, and then you do this, and then don't forget to do that. How? A manual. You follow it, and if you follow it, you know everything, and if you know everything, you have all the answers. That would be easy. I see you, Nicodemus. And I love the fact that you dare to ask questions. I am proud of you. And because our faith, however, is not a 10-point list or the IKEA manual, which I can just follow and flip over the page after I'm done with that screw and flip over the next page after I'm done trying to figure out how that little thingy fits into that little thingy, if you know my language here with uh, trying to figure out how to make furniture or how to uh, follow up to the manuals. I love the fact that even in the middle of the night, Jesus takes time to listen. I don't know about you, but if somebody asks me at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I might not all be that friendly or as quick to answer, to be in a dialogue. I might ask you, can this wait till tomorrow, please? Because I want, I prefer what I have been doing since that time, since you woke me. 
But Jesus is not like that. The questions Nicodemus asks are taken seriously. He is not laughing at him. He is not shaming him for asking how-to questions. Martin Copenhaver, who is a um, UCC minister and also the former president of Andover Newton Theological School, he wrote a book which is called Jesus is the Question. There are 307 questions Jesus asked, and there are three he answered. So for every question Jesus is answer answering, there are 100 questions he is asked. And Jesus is asked 183. How can it be more than, I feel like a four-year-old. Why? 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 Yeah. Any parent, any grandparent ever been to that why stage? And at some point, you might just say, because I said so. <laughs> because I know I have done that. Because there's only so many whys I can take. Or so many hows. <laughs> Not just Jesus, he has all the patience in the world at two or three o'clock in the morning. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And Jesus is the one who encourages questions. I love that even more because only through questions our faith becomes our own. And it's not just knowledge which we memorize somewhere, somehow. And on this journey of discernment and pondering, we are taken seriously. We are met where we are on the journey we are. I know that I have questions. What I learned many, many decades ago in catechism class, I had to memorize. I had to spit it out when I was asked the questions. But by then, from that time till now, I have evolved. I have grown, not only in height, but also in asking, in the knowledge, and the depth, and maybe even in the understanding of what faith is all about. And I realized that what I learned way, 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 way back then. Okay, I get it. This is what I learned. This is what I memorized. These are the creeds. And, there is more to it, more depth, more meat. And I love the fact that Jesus is right there with us. And here's the thing. If you are reading further in John's Gospel, we find Nicodemus two more times. So Nicodemus asked in the middle of the night, and that interaction with Jesus changed him that in chapter 7, Nicodemus is the one who stands up and defends Jesus and saying everybody needs to be heard before being judged. So Nicodemus is the one who stands up and stands up for Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin. And then much, much later after Jesus is crucified, Nicodemus is the one who buys spices, who buys with a lot of money so that Jesus is the one who can have a royal burial. Because of what Jesus, the, in time he invested with him and how he has taken him seriously, will be paid back later on. I love that. One interaction has been wonderful, wonderful uh, consequences. And so he becomes a very loyal follower. Anne Lamott, the author, and I do not know if you're familiar with her, she said the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Let me, remember, let me repeat that. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. Certainty that we know all the answers and certainty misses the point of faith entirely. We are invited to ask. We are invited to, inv uh, to be on the whole messy journey of life with deep faith questions. 
in the discomfort, in the struggle, in the discernment, in the whole ways where we just figure out where do we go, which way do we turn. There's so many options on our flow chart when they go positive or negative, and sometimes life is just too overwhelming. That's where Jesus is, and that's where Nicodemus finds Jesus. Our faith is more than how to follow the manual of any kind of IKEA furniture. Nothing against IKEA furniture. I haven't done it myself. They're very good, very practical. But our faith goes deeper. It is not just a list to memorize. Our faith invites us, all of us, to own our own faith. Yours might be different than yours, might be different than yours, might be different than mine. And that's okay. And that is wonderful. All the questions you might have, please bring them. In a few weeks, actually on <clears throat> September 8th, we're having our Valley Day, and then our faith formation classes will start. Not only faith information, but faith formation. Do you hear the difference? Information is just facts and knowledge you can spill out at any trivia night. But formation is how do we live? What are we going to do with all this? How are we going to live out the faith from Sunday morning from Monday to Saturday in our work life? How are we formed with what we <clears throat> take so seriously with all our questions you have? So I invite you, please bring your questions to the different Sunday school classes, to the midweek classes, to the time when you meet for fellowship, even at a pool party. Bring them with you because that is formation of people, which is much more than information. And then... I promise that we cannot answer all the questions. I'm not, answer, I'm not promising that at all. But we promise to walk with you, to be with you at that journey. And hopefully, hopefully you can be like Nicodemus. After you experience that feel of belonging, belonging to Christ, that then later on, you will actually do the same as Nicodemus does, and stand up for Christ, even though it might be uncomfortable, because you know that you have been a loyal follower, being part of the group where you dare to ask questions. And again, catechism is all good, information is all wonderful, but our faith goes deeper, is much more personal, has personal consequences for us all, more than any kind of knowledge you might have with any kind of dates or numbers or formulas. I invite you, please be like him, be like Nicodemus, and your life is hopefully going to be changed and join us. We can't wait to have you all joining us with your questions, with your doubts, and with who you are, and let's journey on this faith together. You and me, and all of us. Amen.